So first of all, for all those in, uh, joining us or that are going to join us afterwards as well, welcome to our 2023 Dairy Goat webinar series. It's hosted by Iowa State University Extension and our dairy outreach team. So I'm Larry Trannell, dairy field specialist for Northeast Iowa and Southeast Iowa. And Fred Hall, my counterpart with Northwest Iowa, um, is with us as well today. So before we could begin the webinar today, just a few things to take note of, just if everybody could mute their microphones and turn off the camera during the presentations. Uh, except for our presenter, of course. And if you have any questions during the presentations, uh, please feel free to chat or put those in the chat box. And Fred and I will facilitate those at the end. This webinar is being recorded and it's going to be archived to our Dairy Extension website and also our YouTube channel. And we'll be glad to include that link along with um, copies of the presentations and a follow-up email to registered participants. So after the presentation today, we're also going to provide an evaluation link in the chat box. So you can take a few minutes to fill out that survey to help us evaluate the webinar series. Um, so today we're going to focus on what do we know about dry treating dairy goats. Our presenter is Dr. Michelle Buckley, uh, graduated from Western University of Health Sciences in 2017. She spent four years operating a mixed animal um, house call practice in Southern California, providing services for goats, sheep, camelids, pigs, horses, dogs, and cats. And currently, she's a postdoctorate associate uh, with the Department of Vet Diagnostic and Production Medicine uh, with us at Iowa State University's College of Veterinary Medicine. So Dr. Buckley's primary focus is, um, is on the use of pharmaceuticals and judicious use of them in dairy production with a special emphasis on small ruminants. So before we get begin, I'm just we do have the poll question here. So if you're um, with us, if you want to answer those poll questions, um, I'll just give you about uh, five more seconds there to, to answer those, and then I'll end the poll. And so Dr. Buckley can actually get the results of those before um, she begins in here. So we're going to end the poll, and I'll share the results. And so when we take a look at the common causes of staph aureus, non-staph, the E. coli, followed by so the common following rank order as they were listed there. What's not accepted method of detecting subclinical mastitis, um, the visual exam, the culture, and then followed by the somatic cell count. And the third one is what is the udder's primary protection against bacteria during the dry period? So 57% um, said the teat sphincter, 36% the keratin plug, and 7% the annular ring. So with that, I'll stop sharing that. I'll stop sharing my screen. So if Dr. Buckley, I appreciate you joining us. So if you wanna just take it from there and start sharing your screen and we can go from there. All right, well, thank you all so much for um, tuning in today or uh, in the future, if you're watching the recording for this. Um, I'm Michelle Buckley, as Larry so eloquently uh, introduced me. Um, and today I'd like to chat with you about what we know about Dry treating dairy goats. Oh no, it's going to start forwarding my slides on me. Um, I'd like to note that Pat Gordon, my boss, um, supervises all my work. And so he, uh, he also helped me to develop this presentation. So if you have questions, um, feel free to email either myself or Pat. All right. So, um, let me see here. This little sidebar is right in the way. Okay. So what are we going to talk about today? Um, first I want to talk about what do goats normally do to prevent mastitis during the dry uh, period? And then we'll talk about what we can do to supplement their natural defense. Um, what are we defending against? Let's talk about what bacteria are involved and what they're, they could be doing to your goats. And then um, we'll talk about the more specific treatment options. Um, and finally, we'll talk about how to use our, these dry treatment options without affecting milk safety. Maybe go to the next slide. Okay, so let's talk about that. Um, one of those poll questions, what is the goat's natural defense against mastitis, um, specifically during the dry period? So um, this is a animation, obviously, or a drawing of the teat and the base of the gland cistern. Could be a goat or a cow, but for our purposes, we're gonna say it's a goat. And during the lactation, um, you can see that the streak canal is that opening that um, allows milk to go from the teat cistern out into the milking unit or your collection bucket, whatever that um, 
you're using to milk goats, to milk your goats. Um, and then that teat sphincter is actually um, goes around the entire inside of that opening, that street canal. And so that can close it off, um, at least in the short term, um, in between milkings to physically provide a barrier um, to bacteria. Um, so during lactation, the teat sphincter is the main physical barrier to bacteria. However, during the dry period, we're going to see formation of a keratin plug within that street canal to help um, supplement the teat sphincter's uh, defenses. So um, in cattle, we know that the keratin plug, um, how long it takes to form can vary from cow to cow in between seven to over 45 days. So um, no one has done this work yet in goats, to my knowledge, or even sheep. So um, I think that's probably, uh, well, I hope that's coming in the future. Um, but as you can see, there's probably quite a bit of variability going on in our small ruminant patients, just like in cattle. And, and some of these animals are taking almost their entire dry period. Um, if you have a 60 day dry period, um, then they're, we're really just depending on that teat sphincter to provide protection. And that might not be adequate um, for such a long duration. So um, the early dry period is a vulnerable time for the mammary gland because we really only have that teat sphincter as the protective mechanism. Um, in cattle, at least, we know we're probably not getting keratin plug formation before the first seven days. Um, and also we are not milking the animals during this early dry period time, obviously. So we're not removing any bacteria that may have gained entry uh, in the meantime. So um, we definitely wanna make sure that we are providing protection during this period, especially um, during the early parts of the dry period. So how can we detect subclinical mastitis? Because the name itself says that we're not seeing clinical signs. Subclinical means it's flying under the clinical radar. Um, and so if we're not seeing overt outward signs, at least not initially, um, detecting these problems, uh, detecting this disease process could be a challenge. Um, so we have a few options. We can culture, um, and some folks might save culture for... Uh, maybe right before dry off. Some folks might be doing cereal cultures throughout lactation um, if we know that we have a problem on farm, um, but that's going to give us a good idea of exactly what bacteria we're dealing with. Um, and we can even get an idea of how heavy that burden is. Um, we can use the California mastitis test, um, and we've done some uh, presentations on this before, but um, using some reagents that we mix with milk to give us an idea of the level of somatic cells, which in turn gives us an idea of the level of inflammation in the udder as a proxy for subclinical mastitis. Um, we can directly measure somatic cells, um, and a lot of folks are going to be doing that via DHI data. Um, and that can be really useful, especially when it's done in serial um, every month or every 45 days to give us an idea of what kinds of changes we're seeing um, in the amount of shedding of somatic cells. Um, as I mentioned, we talked about these topics before. So in 2022, we had a webinar called Subclinical Mastitis and Dry-Off Decision-Making. And so um, feel free to uh, go and review that presentation on the Iowa State Dairy Extension website, or you can follow the link here below. Um, oh, and I did want to mention here that one of the ways we can sometimes detect subclinical mastitis, although not in, um, as soon as the infection occurs, is um, like we see in this goat here, we'll start to see an asymmetry to the udder. Um, but this is going to be after the infection has been going on for quite a while, and it may not occur in every goat that is infected with um with subclinical mastitis pathogens. So we'll get back to that later, but um, I just wanted to kind of put that in the back of your minds. So the most common bacteria that we see at dry off, um, a lot of folks got this one right in the poll. Um, it's gonna be the non-aureus staph species. So this data is actually from my, my research that we are finishing up right now. Um, and so we cultured almost 2000 goats um, the week before they were getting ready to dry off. Um, and these goats were on farms in Iowa, Wisconsin, and California. And so we pooled all of the culture information and from all of those animals that we cultured, 
uh, 56%, almost 57% did not grow any bacteria, but 41.5% had some form of non aureus staph. Um, and that's kind of a family that we tend to group, a uh, family bacteria that we tend to group together. Um, a little under 1% were infected with staph aureus and not even 1%, um, 0.9% had every other pathogen that we saw. So far and away, non aureus staphs are our biggest challenge um, in goats that don't have obvious clinical mastitis. Um, like I said, these were just basically incidental findings that we um, identified um, around the time of dry off. So um, then let's get into more of the uh, which exact species we're seeing. So far and away, Staph epidermidis and um, Staph capri are were our two most common species that we saw. And you can see there's kind of a list here. There's this general non aureus Staph or NAS grouping um, that was basically where our lab had a hard time of figuring out which exact species it was, but they could tell us it was a Staph and they could tell us it wasn't Staph aureus. Um, so we've got a lot of different species here, but it's pretty easy to see who the, um, who the main offenders are. Um, so, okay, great. These things live here, but we all know that you and I have staff living on our skin all the time. Um, and it doesn't necessarily cause us a problem. So let's talk about what non aureus staff does when it gets inside the udder. <clears throat> As I mentioned before, we can have this lopsided udder um, because a lot of times this subclinical infection that the um, the staph species will present, it just kind of sits in the udder and, and wreaks havoc at a low level. It's going to cause a chronic low level inflammation that's going to result in scar tissue formation. Um, and those, that scar tissue can turn into micro abscesses, so small pockets of bacteria taking up space where we could have functional milk um, producing tissue instead. Um, and the micro abscesses can also uh, like intermittently rupture and shed into the environment. And this can be one way that we see spread from animal to animal. Um, so basically I like to equate it to trench warfare <laughs> and these little staff bugs are sitting in the udder, they're digging in, they're, you know, building their little underground villages and, um, and making themselves comfortable. And then every once in a while, they're going to raise their heads up over the trench um, and cause and start shedding into the environment. Um, or they can even start causing clinical mastitis. But as the inflammation kind of wears away at the functional udder tissue, that's when we start seeing the atrophy and the shrinking of um, usually one half of the udder. And so that's when we see these lopsided udders on our goats. So how does all the subclinical mastitis and non aureus staph actually affect milk quality, right? Because if it's not actually causing a problem to the milk, um, and it's not clinically causing a problem to our goats, then why do we care about it? So there's a lot of studies out there and there's a lot of different findings and, and the results definitely are not uniform. Um, so I went through and looked at all of the research and pulled out a couple studies that I thought um, highlighted some of the main points and some of the more uniform findings. So um, there was a study from the Netherlands in 2010 that was one of the larger studies that I found, um, and I they utilized multiple herds, but it was only over the course of one year. Um, so non aureus staff can hang out for probably longer than one lactation, but this study only looked at one lactation specifically. Um, <clears throat> so when they identified a bacterial infection with non aureus staff, they uniformly saw an increase in somatic cell count. Um, and I'm sorry, that was with any kind of pathogen, not just non aureus staph. Um, major pathogens, mostly staph aureus, like we saw from, um, from our grouping, uh, from our data, uh, is going to decrease milk yield. But the non aureus staph didn't actually affect milk yield just over the course of one lactation. Um, that paper, <clears throat> some good follow up research, um, and what they noted was that there could be more of a slow burn effect where they are seeing um, that atrophy of the functional mammary tissue that might take 
more than one lactation, um, or they might not see the effects fully until they've looked for a few years at the effects on these goats. So um, <clears throat> I think there's a little more work to be done there, but it, it gave us a lot of good information. So a study um, from Germany in 2008 looked at 64 goats and they sampled them at three different times during the lactation. So right at the beginning, right at freshening, then early within the first 10 days, and then towards the end of lactation. So they were over 200 days in milk. Um, when they found non-aureus staph in any of these uh, goats, they found a higher somatic cell count than in um, the other side of the udder that wasn't infected with those pathogens. Um, but they did note that it seemed like they were seeing a bit of an increase on the other uninfected side. It just wasn't as high as the side that was infected. Um, so we can see a whole udder effect here, even if only one half is infected um, by these bacteria. A group from Poland that looked at 66 goats in three different sample points um, per lactation over three years. So they sampled every animal nine times over the course of three years. Um, <clears throat> they saw a really similar pathogen profile to what we saw um, that I showed you earlier with the vast majority being non-aureus staph. Um, they generally noted that there was an increase of somatic cell count when any pathogens were present. But 20% of pathogen of samples that were in the lowest category, so under a million cells per mil, did still contain some non-aureus staph um, pathogens. Um, they just didn't have semantic cell counts over a million. Um, as most of you guys will probably recognize, a million cells per mil, um, that's our legal limit, right, for shipping milk. So that's a pretty high ceiling to have your lowest category of somatic cells. So I would be really curious to see uh, what kind of spread they had within that range um, from zero to a million cells and how those compared to the uninfected halves. But um, sometimes, you know, if we have a raging Staph aureus infection, you can have 10 million cells per mil. Um, you can have an astronomical uh somatic cell count. And even some of our subclinical mastitis girls can have really, really high counts. So um, this does give us some good information as well. All right. So a group out of Israel in 2014 looked at 15 goats and they intentionally infected um, one half of each goat's udder with non-aureus staph. And then they left the other half uninfected. Um, the halves that were infected produced less milk than those that were uninfected. That milk had a decreased lactose concentration um, and also a decreased curd yield. So this is where we're starting to get into our milk quality parameters. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, definitely not going to be creating high quality cheese if we don't have good lactose levels and um, if we're not producing as much curd as we could be not optimizing that production. They also saw increased nitrates and nitrites, which decreased vitamin C levels and ultimately led to a lower nutritional content of the milk. Um, and of course, no one wants bacteria in their milk, right? So the increased bacterial load and somatic cell count led to a decrease in cheese quality. Um, even with pasteurization, <clears throat> there can be challenges with um, cheese quality in in milk products that have a high somatic cell count and a high bacterial load to begin with. So, um, and a lot of goat milk cheeses, I'm sure many of you producers know, um, many of these are raw milk cheeses. So we don't even have that pasteurization to kind of try and uh, level the playing field a bit. So um, we definitely have some concerns about having these subclinical mastitis infections. Um, sorry, let me take a drink here. So I thought this was a really helpful um, graphic that kind of encompassed a lot of the changes that we can see in the udder and how they result um, in milk quality changes. So um, IMI is intramammary infection up at the top. Like I said, that can lead to just physical tissue damage. So we're not having as much functional udder tissue as a healthy udder would. So that's going to immediately decrease milk yield. Um, over here on the right-hand side, um, this increased hemotaxis, that really means white blood cells, the somatic cells that are migrating into the udder. Um, 
<clears throat> so that's going to be what in part increases the somatic cell count in that um, of the milk. Um, sometimes when there is an infection or inflammation in the udder, we'll actually see um, changes in the milk yield as well. Um, <clears throat> so there's kind of a dilution effect where they'll dump more water into the milk to try and dilute the pathogens or the, the inflammation in there. So that's going to affect our somatic cell count as well. Many times during, or, or most of the time during lactation, um, these animals are pregnant. And so those pregnancy hormones and the demands of the fetus can play a role on milk yield as well. Um, and the lacta lactation stage itself um, can change the hormone components um, within the goat and uh, change their ability to produce milk. So all that to say, this is a complicated issue um, and bacteria just complicates it further. So if we can do something to make sure that we are resetting the udder and clearing out those bacteria, um, that's going to give our girls the best chance to produce a high quality product for us and for feeding kids and um, anyone else who's consuming that milk. Michelle, can I ask a question there? Oh, yeah. So if we go back to that, where that dilution effect, so my understanding was always as they took took a look at the research with this dilution effect that the somatic cell count was increased because of lower milk yield. But I think you're saying there's also some extra water or something secreted that also will increase the dilution effect. Yeah. Thanks for pointing that out, Larry. So this is one of those places where the research doesn't agree. Some studies saw a decreased milk yield in halves that were infected with non aureus staph. And that was because, well, they assumed or, or based on their, their research, they thought that it was because of that tissue damage effect, like we talked about before. Um, but other studies actually saw an increase in milk yield um, and a decrease in somatic cell count in some cases, um, or not as big of an increase as they would expect. And they thought that that could be because of the dilution effect where um, the animal is just trying to flush out the udder by dumping more water into their milk. Um, and so... I, I suspect that there's a relationship between which kind of non aureus staph is causing the problem and the way that the body responds. But that is one of the tricky parts about um, the, the research that I reviewed is that we saw a little bit of both and they had, I thought, reasonable explanations for both phenomenon. So did that answer your question? Yeah, very much so. Thank you. Cool. cool. It's never an easy answer. That's what I'm learning in this uh, program. So um, there was a study from a group in China in 2010 um, that looked at uh, cheese quality, specifically in cheese yield. So they found that there was decreased palatability of cheeses from um, goats that had confirmed infections with non aureus staph. Um, they believe that this is because increased cell contents, so those somatic cells and the enzymes that are produced in milk when there is inflammation in the udder, um, those can affect the final quality or the quality of the final product. Um, so this uh, graph here on the right, um, they broke up their the milk um, into three different categories. So milk from low somatic cell count halves uh, had less than 500,000 cells per mil. Um, the medium group was 500,000 to a million. And then the high somatic cell count group was a million to a million and a half. Um, and you can see here, they saw a, a pretty big difference in body and texture of the cheese. Um, the flavor score really didn't change very much. But that is, um, but there are some differences there, just not statistically noticeable differences. And then the total sensory score, um, it was, uh, the less desirable um, cheeses had the higher were within this higher somatic cell count group. So um, more subjective measurements, but still very important um, as far as our final product goes. Um, there was another study by Dr. Gosselin, who is who was based out of Missouri, um, who noted that a somatic cell score of 8.7 or higher, which is a little different than the counts that we've been talking about earlier, but still a, a relatively high somatic cell count um, at dry off are more likely to have a persistent infection 
with um, non warrior staph in the subsequent lactation. So like I mentioned with that first study, this these bacteria can hang out over the course of many years and can wreak havoc over long periods of time. So um, <clears throat> I thought it was interesting that they were able to predict whether the body would be able to clear that infection on its own or not just based on the somatic cell score. Um, there was a study that was actually published in 1999 that actually gave a little bit more accurate uh, way to assess um, the, these persistent infections and whether they would hang around or not. Um, and that had to do with a longer term tracking. So using monthly DHI data instead of just kind of one time point right before dry off. Um, so if anybody's interested in that, we can we can dig through the literature and talk about that a little bit further. Okay, so then we had another study by Dr. Gosselin um, down in Missouri um, that looked at the effects of different staph species in different um, in animals in different lactations. So our parity one or, or first time fresheners. Um, when these animals were infected with these three different species of staphs, so caprae, simulans, and epidermidis, um, they saw a significantly higher somatic cell score than animals with uninfected halves. Um, but in animals that were first or second lactation or greater, basically, um, only halves that were infected with staph simulans were actually um, showing a higher somatic cell score. So that tells us that they might be responding differently to these pathogens at different points in their lives. Do they develop immunity as they get older and are more accustomed to fighting off these pathogens? Um, we don't know. Is this the same across farms? That's another good question um, that unfortunately we weren't able to answer with this study, but it'll keep grad students like me busy for a long time. So, all right, so let's talk about what all of this actually means for your herd. Um, there was a study by Dr. Riggio that showed, um, I believe this was an Italian study that demonstrated a 20% increased risk of being cold if the somatic cell count was higher than 1 million cells per mil in sheep. Um, unfortunately, we don't have this data yet in goats, but I think this would be a very worthwhile data um, analysis uh, or records analysis to, to complete. Um, so really looking at somatic cell count and understanding that non aureus staph is going to be one of our primary reasons or infectious reasons for elevated somatic cell counts um, <clears throat> can help us to, I think, extrapolate from this that we definitely do have an increased risk of culling, um, especially if we're going to have these persistently infected other udders that may or may not be producing less milk, but it's certainly lower quality milk. Um, we're going to have more turnover in animals that are affected by these pathogens. So Michelle, would it be um, fair to say that you could probably extrapolate this onto goats as well? Because I know when I was doing some things on the economics of mastitis in goats, there was one um, research project that showed that the uh, the average life of the doe would actually be about a half a year less um, with uh, really high somatic cell counts. And at that, they were pointing of 1.75 million. Yeah, I think it's very reasonable to extrapolate the general concept of higher somatic cell count equals lower longevity within the herd. I think we need to be cognizant of the differences in somatic cell shedding between sheep and goats, where sheep are going to have probably a more even level uh of somatic cell shedding normally throughout their lactation, we see a much bigger variation in goats throughout the year. And we're gonna see a natural increase um, throughout the lactation um, in, to a much more marked point than we do in cattle and sheep. So I'm not sure that that 1 million cell cutoff is the same in sheep and goats, but I think if you're looking at your herd DHI data and you have, you know, your somatic cell counts graphed out for each of your individual animals and you're noticing that some of them are spiking up way higher than the rest of the herd. Those are probably your girls that you need to be targeting um, and culturing and figuring out what's going on. Otherwise, there's a good chance that they may not be with the herd for as long as you'd like them to be. <clears throat> Does that make sense? Yes, very much so. Thanks. Would you send me that study, Larry? I'd be really interested because I wasn't, I didn't find anything about that, but um, 
I'd be really interested to take a look at it. Sure. Thank you. Okay. So what can we do about all of this? Um, as I alluded to before, um, we have some treatment options um, and we talk about those in that um, the 2022 webinar as well. Um, but we can we kind of break it up into two options. We can treat during lactation. Um, so there was a study in New Zealand that treated does um, for three treatments with a short acting antibiotic in the udder during lactation um, when a, when subclinical mastitis was detected by California mastitis test. So they were only looking at goats that were within the first 10 days in milk. Um, and if they found a high somatic cell count or a high CMT score dough, then they were treating them with one of these two antibiotics. Um, so um, we don't have the same drugs as they do um, in New Zealand. So I didn't put the trade names, but um, these would be short acting lactating goat or lactating cow products. Um, they had a 53% cure rate for the halves that they treated. Um, and then they did leave a subset of these uh, infected halves untreated and only 12% of those were able to cure naturally during the course of the study. So Definitely some better success when they were using the antibiotics than not, which is great. That makes sense, right? It's good to know our antibiotics are useful, um, but they didn't really have a very high level of success with treatment. So um, our other option is to treat during the dry period. Um, oh, rats. I left out my my statistics here. I'm sorry. So in our study, or they might be coming up later on might have gotten out of order. But um, in the work that we've been doing uh, with Iowa State, um, with these does that we were working on in Wisconsin, um, Iowa, and then California, we saw a significantly higher um, cure rate. Man, this thing's jumping all over the place. So we were seeing upwards of 80% uh, cure rate in our does that we treated at dry off with long acting antibiotics. And then um, and then when we cultured them after they kitted, uh, yeah, we were seeing upwards of 80%. And one farm actually had upwards of 90% um, cure rate uh, in their animals. So definitely a much higher success rate in those that were treated. Um, so like it says here, we have a much, uh, a much better chance of curing these infections. Letting those long acting antibiotics sit in the udder um, gives them time to really get into those trenches, metaphoric trenches, um, and uh, and really snuff out the bacteria that have kind of dug themselves into the udder. Um, and this only requires one treatment at dry off instead of repeat treatments during lactation. So um, these can all be really helpful tools um, for making farmers' lives easier, producers' lives easier, um, without having to go back and retreat animals um, every milking for several milkings. Um, obviously, the downside of this is that if we know we have an infection during lactation, we don't really want to wait to dry the animal off to treat them, or we don't want to um, shorten their lactation just so we can dry them off and treat them without long-acting antibiotics. So sometimes a lactating tube is really the best option practically. Um, we also have some limitations as far as um, withhold times um, and uh, and being able to accurately predict the kitting date and the dry period length is really important when we're using those long acting antibiotics because we want to make sure that they have enough time to work within the udder. And we also want to make sure that our does aren't freshening um, before that withdrawal period is up. Um, also, there's a cost of treatment to consider regardless of whether we're going to be doing uh, dry treatment or, um, or treating during lactation. Um, and of course, we're always going to have to be cognizant of withdrawal periods and, and losing out on that milk um, and the sale of that milk until the withdrawal period is passed. So let's talk about dry treatment. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar or, or haven't listen to any of my other uh, webinars. This is kind of what I talk about a lot. Um, so it's infusion of a long acting antibiotic product at dry off um, into the udder that is allowed to hang out there and, um, and do its thing for several weeks. Um, so like I said, we need to consider cost of antibiotics and additional labor, as well as the withdrawal times that are associated with antibiotic use. Our goal is to cure the existing subclinical 
um, mastitis infection, um, and also to protect high risk um, animals from infection early in the lactation in the dry period. Um, a lot of these guidelines are going to vary from farm to farm and how you define high risk animals um, and which ones you target. Um, but Cornell has some great selective dry cow guidelines. Um, that's dry cow treatment uh, guidelines that um, you can refer to. And I'm happy to um, provide references or um, or chat with folks about um, their individual farm, but these selection uh, criteria really vary from herd to herd. So um, a lot of times we're looking at things like, has she had clinical mastitis more than once in this lactation? Or does she have a really high somatic cell count um, over the course of her lactation? So um, those might be some criteria that we would use to, uh, to target just our high risk animals. So we've got a few different methods of dry off that are, I would say, a little more popular in the small ruminant world than in the, the bovine world. Um, in the bovine world, far and away, the most common thing to do when it's time to dry an animal off is to just abruptly stop milking. Um, a lot of times, especially on the larger dairies, these animals are being dried off because their, their milk production has dropped below um, a point that makes it economically feasible for her to continue being milked every day. And so they're not usually producing much anyway. Um, so the discomfort is less extreme than if we were just going to cut her off because she's, you know, been milking for too long. Um, and, and we just said, okay, your time's up. Um, so a lot of these decisions um, in the cattle world are made based on production metrics. Um, but in goats, that's not necessarily always the case. And a lot of times we just say, okay, we're drying off our herd in the fall in, you know, a couple, the next few weeks, because we got to get ready for kidding in, um, in the late winter, early spring. So sometimes we're drying off does that are producing pretty significant amounts of milk. And that can be pretty uncomfortable for those girls. Um, and so a lot of folks will um, will elect to use a different method of uh, dry off. I do think that it's important to note that um, what we talked about in the beginning with the natural defenses and that keratin plug formation, um, the internal pressure of the unmilked udder is actually believed to trigger involution of the mammary gland and keratin plug formation. So, um, so yes, it is uncomfortable, um, but it actually is part of the natural process. Um, so that's an interesting point to consider, I think. Um, as far as using that tapered dry off, there are so many different ways that people utilize this. Some people will just, you know, go from milking twice a day to once a day for a few days and then cut back to every other day um, or just plain stop. Some folks will take weeks um, to go through that process. So, um, Again, there's a lot of variation by farm, but it, it probably does improve goat comfort during the early dry period. Um, but um, going back to that point that I just made about um, pressure trigger triggering involution, could we potentially be hampering that uh, involution process because there's not as much pressure building up when we do finally stop milking? Um, or um, it's just not an abrupt enough change for the udder to recognize what's happening. Um, and also there's concern that this might uh, slow the keratin plug formation process as well. And so again, we're um, potentially, um, this again, work this this research has not been done yet, but we could potentially be actually compromising the immune function of the udder and the, the physiologic repair that the udder goes through during the dry period um, by trying to keep the animals healthy. So I think there's a balance somewhere in between these things, but um, I, there's just important uh, pros and cons to note about both options. Ah. Oh. Okay, here's my slide. So how effective is dry treatment? Um, so when we're looking at our different farms, as you can see, we have a lot of variation. So um, in our California dairy, we had 71% of our infected halves had cured their infection um, at freshening. Uh, the Wisconsin farm was up about 90% and our Iowa farm actually was over 90% cure rate um, within the dry period. So um, there's definitely a lot of variation 
even I'm sure, you know, one farm to their neighbor down the road, I bet you uh, their bacterial populations would respond differently. But definitely state to state, we're seeing some differences. Um, preventing new intramammary infections, we also saw a lot of variation. So our California herd had a 31 and a half percent um Heard 31% of the herd, 32% uh, freshened in with an infection. Um, whereas our Wisconsin herd, we only had 22% um, come fresh with a, a subclinical mastitis infection. And then our Iowa herd was over 50% of these does had a pathogen present or a bacteria present when we cultured them at freshening. So um, a lot of variation even though we use the same drugs, um, on all of these farms. So, um, yeah, again, there's a lot of considerations that need to be made on a farm by farm basis here, but I would like to point out all of our cure rates were significantly higher than that 50% that we saw, um, in the study where they were treating does during lactation. So, um, still more beneficial probably to, to treat during the dry period, just how well you'll get that benefit depends on your farm and your bacteria. So let's talk about how we can use these, um, these antibiotics to dry treat without compromising the safety of the milk that we're going to be producing or the does will be producing um, during their next lactation. So we really need to know the dry period length. We need to know breeding date. So we either need to be hand breeding or artificially inseminating. We could be putting breeding harnesses on males and then checking does every day. If we just have a breeding pen um, and marking, you know, which does have been bred on which day. Um, but it's really important that we're not relying on <laughs> just bucks staying in the pen they belong in. And anyone who's ever owned or worked with goats knows that they're mischievous little guys and they um, are very good at getting out of their enclosures. So um, <clears throat> making sure that we're identifying bucks with breeding harnesses um, can go a long way towards giving us a better idea of how long our dry period should be, um, when to start that dry period, and, um, and when these girls are going to be due to kid. Um, we can also utilize fetal aging via ultrasound, and this is something that your veterinarian should be able to help you with. Um, but just looking at the um, the fetuses on ultrasound and their size can give us an idea of how far along they are. Now, I will say there is pretty significant variation um, based on multiples. So if you have five kids in there, um, they're probably all going to be smaller than if you have a doe with a single. Um, that kids, they could be the same age, but they're not going to be th the same size. So knowing your breeding dates is really going to be um, <clears throat> the most accurate way um, for predicting uh, due dates and dry period lengths. We need to know dry period length because um, all of our products that are um, that we're going to be using these intermammary products have a uh, recommended dry period on them, and also um, that will play into our meat withdrawal, our tissue, um, yeah, our meat withdrawal and, um, how long the animals need to be dry before they can start milking again. These are all things that you're going to see on the label for those intramammary antibiotics. So we need to be identifying which animals receive treatment. So obviously this needs to be recorded, um, ideally digital records, but at the very least written down somewhere that is um, <clears throat> not likely to get erased like a whiteboard or lost like a sheet of paper. Um, so if there's a record book in the treatment room or something like that, a, a more permanent option. But again, digital records are far and away preferred. Um, and we also need to be identifying the actual animals. So they should all have permanent ID, like a tattoo, um, as well as a temporary identification, like a leg band or a neck band or um, something to that effect. It's also best if we can separate these treated does into a different pen. So if you're treating your whole herd at dry off, um, then that makes things easy, right? But if we're treating selective individuals that are high risk, um, maybe housing them in a separate pen during the dry period um, and certainly after kidding 
uh, making sure that they go into a separate pen or are milked with the hospital pen or right before the hospital pen um, can help to ensure that we are not allowing milk from treated animals that will have a drug residue in it. Um, we'll prevent that from going into our bulk tank and uh, causing problems with um, your processor or if you're, you know, if your family is drinking it, um, we certainly don't want anyone exposed to those residues either. So um, as far as withhold period goes, this needs to come from your veterinarian and they are going to have to request it specifically from um, FARAD, which is uh, an independent agency that looks at all of the data out there and says, okay, well, based on the research that we found, um, you should you know, you need to make sure that that milk is not being consumed for a set number of days or that meat is not being consumed for a set number of days. Um, this is not the same number as what's on the label for cows because cows and goats process um, drugs differently. And so we need to make sure that we're being extra careful um, that we're, uh, we're calculating for that. Um, there's also some differences as far as the federal uh, regulations for how much drug um, or, or what the tolerance is for, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, how much of that residue is, um, is present for between cows and goat's milk. So that's more on the technical side of things. That's more of my job, probably not a producer concern, but the main point is that uh, the label withdrawal for cows does not apply to goats, and it's probably going to be a longer withhold time for your goats. So ask your veterinarian. Um, it's also important to realize that this milk um, from treated animals does contain some level of antibiotics in it, and, and those residues are um, active ingredients. So it's not the same amount of active ingredient that you infused when you dried her off, but there is still some in there. And so um, we want to make sure that we're not feeding that to our young stock because we don't need to be ab accidentally dosing our brand new baby kids with antibiotic treated milk. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, that can affect the bacteria in their GI tract. Um, and it can, it has potential to um, select for some antibiotic resistance. So um, we really do need to be disposing of milk from animals that were treated and not using it to feed kids. I know that stinks to, uh, to have to be wasting milk like that. But um, so, and then the last kind of safety uh, precaution that we can do um, to make sure that we're not getting any of these drug residues into our final products is by testing milk before does rejoin the milking string that is being used for consumption. So um, there are really two goat side tests that are um, that are validated for goat's milk. So we know they're going to work to detect certain antibiotics in goat's milk. Um, there are lots of tests that are validated in cow's milk, but, um, as we all know, those two products have a little bit different compositions. And so that can affect the way that those tests run. So, um, we want to make sure we're using tests that are validated for goat's milk and for the antibiotics that you're using in your goats. Um, your veterinarian, your local processor, the Iowa State Extension team, myself and Dr. Gordon are all good resources for deciding which tests to use and how, uh, and making sure that you're running those tests properly. Um, so setting protocols for you. Um, so please don't be a stranger and uh, feel free to reach out um, if you or your veterinarian have questions about how to utilize this resource. Um, we do not currently have an accurate test for um, detecting meat residues. And so um, being sure that we are extra cautious about adhering to withdrawal periods before uh, processing animals for meat um, is really the, the only way that we can be safe about um, preventing residues in our meat products. But um, for milk, we do have some tests we can use. So that's handy. <laughs> And with that, I will wrap it up. I had a lot of references here. So if any of you guys are nerds like me and want to go read some papers um, that I discussed earlier, that is my list. Um, otherwise, I will be happy to take questions. And then, Larry, we can uh, throw that poll up. and uh, Or maybe we should do the poll now, and then uh, I can take questions. Okay. Do you want to start on the first question about inserting 
the antibiotic uh, treatment? Do they massage that antibiotic antibiotic up into the udder to get it up in the trenches, so to speak? Mo's asking that on the chat. Oh, okay. Yes, uh, Mo, absolutely. That's a great question. Let me take a look and make sure. Um, so when you're when you're actually administering the antibiotic, we want to make sure first of all that we're inserting the tip of the applicator as little as possible. You don't want to shove the whole tip up there because that's just increased surface area that we could hypothetically potentially be um, introducing bacteria into the udder. So um, <clears throat> you just want to do as little of the applicator as possible into that um, T orifice. And then when you do infuse the antibiotic, definitely want to make sure you're massaging um, the treatment up there afterwards to make sure it's well distributed. Um, I can tell you from my work with internal T sealants, which are a little bit different from um, the antibiotic products, but um, work in very similar way or they, they're applied in a very similar way. Um, we know that that teat sealant actually does get up into the gland just by cows walking around um, and doing their normal cow things. And, and that's probably the same in goats too. So um, do I think it's a make it or break it thing that you uh, massage the treatment? No, but it's definitely a good practice. So so Michelle, the poll questions I have were the same three at the beginning. I don't have oh, any additional okay. ones of that. Is there hmm. anything else? in those you wanted to um, to talk about? Um, well, I think we covered most of them. I sent Jen some different questions. I wonder if they might not have gotten to her in time um, about management practices. So I was curious to see um, how many folks were using uh, temporary IDs on their animals that they're treating during the dry period. So are they identifying animals that have been treated? Um, and I had a few questions like that, but... Um, I think everyone did pretty well on the uh, on the quiz. Hopefully, they'd be able to answer all the questions 100% right now. Sure. Um, yes, yeah, so I don't see the other those other questions there. Yeah, so. sorry about that, guys. Not a problem. We have a question from Sally. Uh, do you recommend bulk tank cultures to monitor subclinical mastitis? Um, that's definitely a good place to start to get an idea of what pathogens you might have on your farm. Um, I, I would say probably a more accurate way to keep a finger on the pulse of what's going on with your goats would be to, um, either culture regularly, which gets expensive and time consuming very quickly. Um, but if you're truly having a problem, especially with like a staph aureus outbreak, we're probably going to need to be culturing, um, but California using the California mastitis test on a regular basis or, um, or participating in DHI testing um, to get somatic cell count data for individual animals is a more um, accurate way to figure out where each individual doe is at, especially if you're having issues with maybe your herd, your bulk tank somatic cell count is getting up towards that 1 million limit. Um, we want to be able to see, okay, who's shedding a ton of somatic cells that maybe if we pull her out of the string, uh, we can get that, that number back in control. Um, so I, I value individual animal data a lot more than bulk tank data. Um, for subclinical mastitis, but um, it's not a bad idea to do a bulk tank culture every now and then to see what's going on. I hope that answered your question, Sally. Um, oh, one more question here from Robin. Yeah, which dry treatments are most effective? Yeah. Um, well, we haven't tested all of the dry treatments, uh, the intramammary antibiotics. And again, there's going to be variation based on farm because your pathogen profile um, is going to vary based on your particular farm. So um, what drug you use to treat those pathogens is also going to vary um, or, or which uh, non-aureus staph species um, it's going to be most effective on. So um, I think it really depends on what you've used in the past and what you've been successful with. Um, with my work, we were looking specifically at cloxacillin benzathane, which is Orbenin DC, that Merck product, and then tomorrow, which is a cefepirin um, benzathane product um, from BI. And we really didn't see a difference between the two treatments. I still need to finish running all of the stats, but we don't. We're we're still compiling the last of our data, so. Um, 
I don't have the, you know, statistical significant p-values for you, but I can tell you just from looking at the raw data, um, we really didn't see much of a difference between those two products um, on the farms that we were working with. Again, again, a reminder that we put the evaluation in the chat box um, if anyone wants to start taking a look at that. But do we have any other questions? You can ask the questions live too. Any other questions for Michelle? I do have one that's a direct message here that asks what kind of sheep they used in that um, the Italian study looking at um, the longevity of the animals in the herd based on somatic cell count. And I don't remember, honestly, um, but if you want to email me that question at mpbuck um, at iastate.edu, um, I can look it up and get back to you. All right. Any other questions for Michelle? We've got a, a question that's asking where well, you had the state variations. Do you think part of that was because of different stresses? You know, Iowa, colder weather kind of thing. Do you think there's stresses that are affecting that because of the location? That's a great question. I'm sure that environmental stressors play a role. Um, we have been collecting the data that I referenced today over the last two years, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the last year and a half. Um, and so some of those does were dried off in the middle of the summer. Some of them were dried off between Thanksgiving and Christmas. Um, so there was a lot of variation in the weather between all of those farms, um, I don't think, like I said earlier, I think there's probably a noticeable difference from, you know, two farms right next door to each other just down the road. Um, so I don't know that it's even necessarily exclusively because there were, you know, different regions, different management styles, different weather patterns, but I'm sure that it all plays a role. This is for myself. When uh, you indicated that some of the research said or indicated an increase mm -hmm. in production, does it follow suit then that you would see a decrease in milk solids, especially fat? Mm -hmm. Did they test that? And um, The one study that comes to mind saw a decrease in casein. I don't know that they looked at milk fat and protein, or I can't remember off the top of my head. I, I kind of just had to pick a couple of studies to put in here, but um, yeah, they did see like a dilution, a true dilution effect with whatever um, parameter they were, they were looking at, but they were looking for that dilution effect. And I can't remember exactly the way that they identified it, but, um, it was like a higher volume, but lower concentration of certain components. I think the tendency would be that the, uh, the fat would actually decrease some of the proteins that depending on which, um, um, bacteria we're looking at is might actually increase a little bit. Right. Yeah. There's so many nuances. It is not a, uh, it's not an easy subject, but the moral of the story is that at the end of the day, it's going to impact your your cheese quality. Um, and so I think that was the big takeaway that I got from most of that work. <clears throat> and this maybe is a Larry question, or Michelle. Uh, did you put any numbers to the losses? I mean, as we get higher cell counts, can you say, okay, there's a uh, X dollar loss that you're going to experience? That's a good question. I think Larry would be more uh, competent at that analysis than I would, but um, we don't really have data to say, you know, how much are we losing in longevity within the herd in goats? So I couldn't really do the analysis for that. We didn't have a uniform response to um changes in components. Um, and, and a lot of those uh, studies didn't look at all of the same things. So I didn't, <clears throat> excuse me, even attempt a financial analysis because all those studies were run a little bit differently and they looked at different things. Um, so I think that'd be a great project for Larry to do down the road and we can totally team up on it, but uh, it wasn't something I looked into today. So I, I did actually look into that with, um, doing the uh, the modules that we had for the economics of goat utter health. And so I would tell you, say in general, if you're looking at some research from the Czech Republic, from Pol or from uh, Spain, and also from France, that I would think in a generality would be anywhere from $60 per doe 
up into that $150 per doe per year. But when you get into that $150, we're talking about um, goats that have average uh, semantic cell counts over 1.75 million. So they're trying to compare these to, to ones that are like under a million uh, or to um, 1.75 million. So three different groups of them. And the medium group was kind of about 60 to $90 difference between the first group and the third group that have had the really high somatic cell counts were probably in that even close to $150. So it does affect the number of kids that are born, uh, the lifetime of the doe itself. And so just their life, net lifetime merit, if you kind of compare it to a dairy cow, is definitely um, uh, reduced um, in using somatic cell count as a measure for it. Awesome. So any other questions from anybody or comments? So if not, I want to mention that the, the next uh, dairy goat webinar will be November uh, 16th. It's going to be the dairy goat cost of production. Um, Marlene Pabe Macy, I, I know I'm going to torture that, or I know I did torture that one, but she's from the, uh, she's a dairy specialist with the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs uh, from Canada there. Uh, so she's going to be with us on November 16th, same time and place here. So, so with that, we appreciate everybody um, uh, joining with us today. Again, this will be uh, published online as well. So uh, the recording will actually be up online if anyone wants to review it or if any others want to uh, take part of it. So with that, any other closing comments, Fred? No. Michelle? Very interesting. Thank you, Michelle. Right. Thank you, everyone, for signing on today. Take right. care.